Uh, thank everyone to, uh, to be exposed to the phase diagrams. So I am a materials, materials chemist from National Institute of Standards and Technology. And uh, my background back from the days back in Moscow State University was phase diagrams, crystal growth. And so applying that knowledge to new materials is really uh, rewarding and, and exciting. So as an outline of the talk, uh, I, I will talk about just reminding you what the phase diagrams are, which is a map. It's a road map for materials. And then a few examples from different fields, how phase diagrams apply to graphene growth, to TMD, and other 2D materials. And then growth and processing, it's, it's the same thing, right? It's a temperature exposure, chemical exposure. So uh, examples between growth and processing really interrelated. And there will be a few examples of band gap, phase change that uh, Evan talked, and, and Jim, uh, the contact engineering, and so forth. So very briefly, NIST, we are in two campuses, Boulder and Gaithersburg, close to Washington, 25 miles from Washington, so I'm here. Uh, we are the oldest national lab, and we are the industry lab, so we're not attached to any particular agency. I mean, we are DOC, but we, we're working for the whole industry of the United States, uh, supporting industrial innovation through measurements, standards, and data. Uh, we have a lot of facilities, networks, international, national, about 3,000 employees, as many guest scientists or associates, and we have the NRC postdoctoral program. I'd like to advertise tw twice a year, uh, August and February, for U.S. cities, and unfortunately, I mean, that, that's the uh, framework, but uh, we welcome NRC postdoc, as well as associates to apply to NIST. Some metrics here with a lot of standard materials and so forth. So let me start. So why is the phase diagram? Why is it important? Is it just curiosity or is it more, more in the phase diagram than just funny maps? Uh, two examples here. One on the left is a boron silicon system. And this is a, in terms of temperature and composition. And the pressure would be looking this way if we're talking a full diagram, temperature, composition, and pressure. So this is a cross section of the in the temperature composition uh, uh, projection here. And what, what this is important for, we see phases, right? We see the melt above at high temperature. We see silicon on the right-hand side. We see a few compounds between boron and silicon. And so we're really focusing on, for the processing, we're focusing on silicon. So first thing we see right away is that processing is limited to this temperature. It, it's high, but for 2D materials, some of them, it's, it's much lower. So we have to be aware of stability limit for, uh, for the material looking at the phase diagram. The second part, which is actually even more important, if you go in this way, horizontally, then the homogeneity range for silicon only goes to, uh, only accommodate 3% or less, depending on temperature. So understanding the limit of processing, and as, as, as a result of overdoping the material with boron uh, appearance of the secondary phases, you can read them from the phase diagram. So that's the uh, value of, of phase diagram knowledge. One on the right, a little bit more complicated. Now it's a three-component system, because let's say for metal contact on 2D materials, it's chrome, moly, and sulfur. So this line becomes a triangle. Temperature now goes up. So it's a 3D image, and then you can slice it at different temperatures, like a pie. And if you bring the pressure here, that becomes four-dimensional system, so you have to navigate on that. But the point is, that diagram, or part of the diagram, may actually explain what's happening when you put the metal on top of the any material, including 2D, in terms of reactivity. And then it actually proves that if you have some reaction between chrome and molybdate sulfide, the whole work function difference approach, where you look at the work function of the two and then you assume the barrier between the two, it's not apply, it does not apply if you have the reaction in the system. Okay, so let's start with the growth overview, and then how this growth relates to the phase diagrams. Start with a very simple approach here. It's a uh, beauty of that is uh, we can grow large scale wafers, up to two inch wafers in a CVD reactor. And this is a metal film. A lot of groups using that, obviously, in North Carolina was probably the first one, uh, NC State. So the metal film converts to molybdate sulfide when you purge either sulfur or selenium gas through. And so you make a uh, large scale wafer here. Now, somewhat 
similar, also vapor transfer, well, sorry, that, no, that's a vapor transfer growth, and that's exfoliation approach, right? When you grow single crystals of material, this is about five millimeter to centimeter across, niobium diselenide that we make in a lab, or gallium selenide. And, and so the process is in a closed volume. So in that regard, it's safe. You don't need a big furnace. It's just a ampule of a uh, few inches uh, long. Inside of the ampule, you have a transfer of material. You go from the hot zone of a powder, say, molybdate sulfide, and you use bromine, iodine, or other volatile um, chalcogen, sorry, not chalcogen, the, the uh, group six, group seven, and then you transform, transfer the material to the colder part, and you grow crystals, then you use exfoliation. So this is the uh, most typical way to produce uh, single crystal 2D materials. At the middle one, it's two chemical vapor deposition processes. Uh, MOCVD is just you know, part of the general CVD approach. And in the CVD approach, you see this chemical reaction here in the furnace, molar oxide, sulfur gas becomes molar sulfide, and has some other byproducts. And technically, it's arranged in this uh, horizontal tube furnace. You have mol mol molybdenum source, a sulfur source, argon gas, and then substrates. Metal organic CVD is similar, but instead of using inorganic saucers, uh, people apply metal organics. So we use this ad nomo compound, and it's a pulsed CVD. So it's like atomic layer deposition, but with metal organics. And, and, and this is the source for sulfur. Um, and, and so then again, you can grow large scale, similar to that scale, films. And, and this is an example when we pulse just one cycle of these uh, two sources, we came out to about 1.8 nanometer thick, which is too thick for the monolayer, but we were moving that way to, to optimize. So again, uh, we have this CVD uh, branch here, and all the rest of the processes are lumped up into just one list. So a physical vapor deposition, MBE, uh, that's probably the most industrially scalable approach. Plus layer deposition, electrochemical, and a lot of solution processes that we also do at NIST for uh, inkjet printing, for example, on flexible substrates. Uh, but the key, I will not focus on that, so the focus will be in these few examples how the phase diagram help to guide the process. Let's start, step back with the graphene, which is a CVD process, right? We're all familiar with that. So this is an example of uh, graphene STM image with a different configuration on nickel. And the process is a chemical vapor deposition. So you purge the methane, or it can be ethylene, into the uh, bulk of substrate, which is nickel, nickel film or nickel foil. And then once you saturate the nickel with carbon, then it precipitates back and form the monolayer or multilayer, depending on the skills. And this is the same thing on a 3D view where, again, we put in the uh, methane inside of the nickel substrate and carbon goes into the lettuce. Um, and then upon cooling of the wafer or, or the film, then the carbon migrates, diffuses back to the surface, and then forms a nice single crystal monolayer. And so what is the phase diagram here? Or is, it, is it important? Is it not? It is important. And, and this is the phase diagram if you use the example of nickel. So this is nickel composition. This is carbon. This is temperature again for the growth. And then what we're focusing on again, like the case of the boron uh, silicon case, we're focusing on this part. And we're looking at that area. If I blow this, I'll blow it up. So the area of nickel alloy or nickel matrix and how much carbon it can take, how much carbon can absorb as a function of temperature. And you see here, for example, at 1,000 Celsius, you can get up to uh, one, I don't see the number, one and a half percent of nickel. Oh, sorry, one and a half percent of carbon into the nickel. And so the process then can be visualized, the process of the growth. So when we purge the uh, carbon into the matrix, what's happening there, again, we stuff nickel lattice with carbon and, and retaining the crystal structure of nickel. Now, and that's the process on the map, right? If this is growth temperature 900 C, this is how the composition changing, accommodating more and more uh, nickel, uh, more and more carbon, sorry. Then when we cool it off, 
So what's happening here, we end up in this region, in, in the white region. So let me grab the better. Yeah. So we end up in this uh, two-phase region on the phase diagram, which is there, which is graphite and nickel. And, and so all the carbon now at this low temperature is not able to stay inside of the crystal lattice. So it, it, it gets removed from the matrix and, and then precipitates on, on the surface. So the bottom message here is that metal carbon phase diagram sets the solubility limit for carbon. So the phase diagram is helpful whether we use copper, which by the way takes much less of, of, of the carbon than nickel, or other metals. So we can look at that map and understand our limits. So for each temperature, we would know how much carbon can go in. And then when we cool it off, how much of carbon we should expect to evolve from the matrix. So this is an example of using phase diagram for the graphene. So let's take it to 2D or transition metal or other layered materials. So this is CVT process that I showed. Uh, it was the upper le uh, middle left corner. So again, CVT process, chemical vapor transport, is we have a charge inside of the uh, evacuated ampule temperature profile and some volatile agents like iodine to grab the material and transfer into the colder part of the zone. And I'm using an example of molybdate telluride, which was discussed today quite a lot by, by Jim, by Evan. And so this is two STM images, STM images of these two crystal structures that were discussed before lunch. One is a semiconductor, hexagonal, and monoclinic is metallic. And so the question is, can we, what, what are they on the phase diagram? How do we apply phase diagram knowledge to the growth? So you put the phase diagram here, and this is a modified phase diagram from the literature that we are reassessing. And if you put, again, it's composition here, right? Molyditellurite is right there. And this is temperature and a bunch of other phases around. And so these are two crystal structures, one T prime phase here at high temperature and two H phases there. Uh, what you notice is that transition temperature is not a fixed one. It's a function of composition. That, that's the use of the phase diagram too, where if you have deficiency of tellurium in your blue 2H phase, then the decomposition or transition temperature is lower by at least 100 degrees, 800 to 900. So using that knowledge, we can now take the sample and, and define what the growth temperature is. And so that's the case. We, we, uh, this is the actual ampule, and this is the scale here. It's one centimeter. So quartz ampule with a lot of single crystal grown inside, the size of 5 to 10 millimeter, used for exfoliation. And they look the same whether it's a T prime or 2H visually, but, oh, sorry, but the growth defines what material we make. So if we grow the material, say, at about below 800 C, we always produce 2H. When we grow the material above 800 C, typically 900 to 1,000, then we produce uh, 1T prime. So that's clean and easy example of understanding why diagram are important, phase diagram are important. Now, we also see the upper limit, but of course no one goes to 1180, otherwise you melt or decompose your molybdenum ditellurite and you form a different phase. Actually, MO68, one is missing here. Right, and so this is an example of uh, characterization where we actually cycle, we can cycle the uh, phase change back and forth, back and forth. So we can grow the material in 2H state, and as I said, we have to be below 800 C. Then we raise the temperature in the ampule to above transition temperature, and it becomes 1T prime. This is a X-ray diffraction spectra to confirm. And then Raman shows the same. And then from 1T prime, from that temperature, you reduce the temperature either slow, cool, or, or uh, quenched low temperature, stay there, and then you go back to uh, TH. So same flake visually will stay the same, but it goes through this transformation of, of phases. And then, uh, speaking of the device application, of course, uh, both of the uh, T prime and, and TH, we put them in FET configuration. This is a top view in SAM. We'll do some crystallography as well to understand what the crystallographic axes are. And the bottom line, just confirming this is metallic state for that red phase. 
and the semiconducting state, this is a gate voltage, it's a p-type material here, uh, 4 to H. And so example of this phase diagram, again, is it's very useful to understand where are we, not only in the temperature field, but also in a compositional variation. And, and there will be more example of compositional effect on the properties. Can I say a quick question? Yes. What's that gap between the two phases there? Gap here? here? Yeah. Uh, the, on a phase diagram you, diagram, you always go plus one or minus one. Uh, if it's a first order transition. So between single phase and single phase, there should be two phase region. And my professor would kill me if I don't put the two phase uh, region between the two, right? Or between two and say you go from two phase to four phase, that should be three phase in between. So, you, you, all right. So it's a two phase region, but it's not really practical. It's, it's typically narrow. Okay, so moving on with the uh, other examples for phase diagrams for uh, growth, and this is CVD. Uh, this is a true CVD process that pretty much everybody is using for the exfoliation, and then, as I mentioned, the sulfurization method. So here is the map, again, the road map, just to understand where are we. Uh, it may not be pra that practical to understand how to change the growth conditions, but I think it's important to understand where are you on the map. And so on this map, when we have a three component system, moly, oxygen, and sulfur, right, you put the compositional triangle here, you put all the existing phases that, that we know of, moly 2S3 in addition to MOS2, there is a very stable moly dioxide we have to be aware of, and then what you do, you break tri triangle into sub-triangles. So each of the triangle inside is a three phase region of three, three, three phases coexisting. So why is that important? Uh, first, again, when we do sulfurization, we can route this process on, on the phase diagram at the given growth temperature. So that's the easy case. We go from pure molybdenum to molybdisulfide, but be aware that in that process of transformation, you may get stuck on a different phase. So it's important to know as you go A to B, what's in the middle, right? Is it a clean path or is it some bumps in, in terms of how the phase is forming? Same thing on the MO, uh, moly oxygen side. And let's map the process from moly oxide to sulfur forming moly dioxide. So this is the path here. And it is a clean path, and this is why it's successful, but what's important to understand, are there any ternary phases here? Because there are some, a lot of oxysulfides exist in, in different systems that sometimes people even overlook or don't care about. But if there is not a phase sitting here, that would be an obstacle to get from A to B. Plus, small deviation of composition. This is why phase diagram is a good visual tool. If you start losing your oxygen, moving away from O to the left, then from that straight line of conversion, you end up in a three-phase region. So what you may discover in your growth system up there, you may find MO2, uh, molybdenum dioxide, part of MO3, and your target MO, MOS2. So again, this helps to visualize what to expect and what is the path uh, moving from target to, to the goal. And, and so the pitfalls, when I say phase diagram indicate the pitfalls, this is a two exa one example of be aware what's the phase in between before you get to where you want to go. Okay, so let's move from the growth to processing now, which is pretty much the same temperature composition variables, but slightly different aspects. And let me go back for, for the second from just this is a growth process, this is a phase diagram. Let me revisit the uh, Y2D, even though you know, we have this talk so far this morning. But this is one example of benchmarking 2D materials. And I'll, I'll translate that into material property in a second. So this is the uh, publication from last year, all modeling, benchmarking of 2D materials relative to outer thin uh, um, single-gate silicon FET, it's all FETs. And so on this map, it's a energy of switching versus time delay. So definitely preferred corner for the FET is, is this lower left corner where you want to go low energy and fast switching. And for 2028 node, 
even for 2019. Again, it's a busy slide, apologize too many. But you can see that the 2D material can beat uh, the ultra thin silicon in, in quite a good switching behavior energy wise. Now, how does that translate into the property? So, same paper, I mean, all related. Now you can see that on the map of doping density in the material to current, scattering current, this is the sweet spot. So we have for these devices to perform, this is where we have to be. So that's the carrier concentration, doping density we should achieve. So now we're going from the device benchmarking to material property that we need to make and back to your material chemist for, for us to say, okay, so now we know what you need as a device people, let us try to make that material with this particular density, doping density. And so question from here, from device performance con um, tells us what the material parameters should be and also what materials to use. And, and thank you to Evan, I have to cross this 500 number to 1173 uh, in, in the power of read. And so which material to use and how to control the property? And specifically, so we know what the property should be in this particular example. So how does that depend on the processing? When we say processing, we need a phase diagram. So the illustration of let's get there. Before we get to 2D controlled doping, which I guess does not exist in the state of the art, it's, it's very hard to do the intrinsic or extrinsic doping of the material. Let's go back to the example that we all know, which is a silicon boron doping of silicon. So it's extrinsic doping. And this is the map of resistivity as a function of boron concentration, p-type. So each boron creates a hole. And then all the holes are active, sorry, all the boron atoms substitutional are active. So one atom of boron give, gives us one hole. And so from here, again, very, very easy to calculate the required resistivity or current, as, as in the previous example, as a function of carrier concentration. But the question comes here, so how much boron can we put in there? And again, answer is well known, but it's a good illustration of where we need to go for 2D materials. So we know how much boron we can st stuck or stuff into silicon, uh, that, that much, or about 1.5% at this temperature. So phase diagram is useful just for that particular reason. As I said, we'll look at the phase diagram, and this is the blown up image of the corner close to silicon. So this region is a homogeneity range of silicon. This is how much boron you can dissolve without destroying the crystal lattice. And then as we move on and we overdose, overdope the material, then the phase diagram tells us, oh, uh oh, this is what you will get if you put too much. So again, if engineer is asking me to, to make it one to the minus three resistivity on this map, you cannot get there. You cannot put more than 10, 5 to 10 to the 20th of boron. If you push more to make it less resistive, this is what you will end up with on a phase diagram. You, you produce a secondary phase. How does it manifest itself? This is an example of, uh, and by the way, I forgot to mention, most of the presentation is from, from the literature, and I put the references here. And when it's a NIST work, then I just indicate NIST. But the goal for this seminar was really to show state of the art in the field rather than what, what we do at NIST. But anyway, so when you put too much boron, and this is a 3D map, tomography map, an atom probe tomography that shows the boron precipitates in the volume of, of silicon. And another indication of that, you see those streaky lines, they call 311 defects, which is dislocation loops. They actually accumulate boron trisilicide. And so, it's a good match, right, of, of device people saying we need that much boron. Then phase diagram people saying, well, be aware of what's coming. And then the microscope is actually proving that all these defects is accumulation of extra boron, which is pushed away from the crystal lattice. So having that example would have been nice to have something like that in 2D materials. But just to finish up with the boron silicon case, uh, if you turn that phase diagram on the side, this particular line is a how much of the dopant you can put as a function of temperature, and that translates, this is a phase diagram, but more for, as I said, for people 
in, in engineering to just read it off right away. So this shows that different dopants, you can put that much as a function of temperature. And as I said, going over uh, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 20th will stop. You can't put more than that. And you can see actually a decline of solubility uh, for arsenic, for example, when you go high temperature, for antimony, for phosphorus, and so forth. So this is a phase diagram. And so the bottom line here, not, let's now switch to 2D or new materials. So in the 2D materials, if you want to imply, right, if you want to use substitutional doping, we need to put atoms, right, either on the metal side to, to do the NOP type doping or on the chalcogen side. Chalcogen sublattice, you have, say, phosphorus, nitrogen, arsenic to make it P-type, and then and these elements, uh, chlorine and so forth, to make it N-type. And so the story here is we don't have those. This is where we need to go. We need to develop these phase diagrams, or at least partial phase diagrams, to understand how much of phosphorus or chlorine or the metals can you stuff into the 2D material. And the more you put there, of course, uh, well, not of course, but that would be translate into higher and higher conductivity or switching type. You can switch from N to P type. Phase diagram, again, will help to map it and understand how much of the dopant you can put in. Let's go to a, what seemed to be a simpler case, but it's actually tougher, is from extrinsic to intrinsic doping. And it's very easy to understand the intrinsic doping, right? We have, say, molar disulfide with the sulfur vacancies, and this is why we write it 2 minus x. And so these are sulfur vacancies uh, fr from this paper in uh, TM. Uh, it is TM. And then again, sulfur vacancy, if it's charged, double charged or single charged, will produce the carrier. And this is why molar disulfide intrinsically and type because it's full of vacancies of, of sulfur. And so the question is the same. So what is the limit of X? How much, in this case, how much I can remove from the crystallitis of sulfur, having it highly conducting material, but still not destroying the phase? And so the answer, before I show the phase diagram, this is the old paper on a 76 paper on a bulk material. And this is the conductivity as a function of non-stoichiometry or deficiency of, of sulfur in molar disulfide. Oh, sorry, this is molar ditelluride, but it's the same story. So this map shows, or the, the conduction, conductivity as a function of temperature, shows that for different deficiency of tellurium, we get higher and higher conductivity, and that's what we want. For example, if there is no deficiency of tellurium stoichiometric composition, that's the conductivity. If you subtract 0.01, uh, from that or from here, then you get more carriers, 0.02, more, more, and then boom, suddenly when you take away too much tellurium from the lattice, your resistivity drops, you try to remove them more, it drops even further. So uh, the phase diagram, and this translates, because you know, for me to think in terms of phase diagram, I need to know atomic composition in the, on the phase diagram. So each of that correlation is purely stoichiometric, 66% tellurium, and so forth. So where is it on a phase diagram? Again, this is a molybdenum tellurium phase diagram from the literature that we're optimizing right now as well. Uh, and then what we're doing here, when we go from point 0.1 to point 0.4, you're removing tellurium. So removing tellurium means that you're moving to the left on the phase diagram. And so this is the uh, indication that uh, basically, removing tellurium will increase the conductivity. And ideally, you would like to control that and understand what is the homogeneity width, how much tellurium I can take away, and what happens after. Because if you take too much out, beware, again, there is, something will happen. And the phase diagram tells us what will happen. Uh, this is an example of switching gears. Uh, th this is an example of band gap engineering that were, were discussed in, in, in previous talks. And this is the map of alloy. So we're now going from compound to the alloy systems. So in the alloy system, this is a graph from industry where the band gap is a function of lattice parameters mapped for all different compounds. So we're going from 
So three fives here to silicon germanium, three fives again nitride, and so this is where gallium nitride is UV. Adding indium makes it blue LED and green LED. There is no red LED, and there is a reason for that. The phase diagram says no, you can't mix gallium and indium and, and make it homo uh, homogeneous alloy. But I just added to the same graph, I added the TMD compounds. So you see that, for example, molybdate sulfide, if we're talking direct band gap, you can actually tune the band gap from molybdate sulfide to molybdate telluride, or use a green example here, you can take molybdate sulfide and alloy it with niobium diselenide, sorry, molybdate diselenide with niobium diselenide, and the band gap will drop to zero. So that's what the simple exercise is. We know the end member band gaps, let's put them together. And so when you say, let's put them together, let's alloy them, this is where the phase, di phase diagram comes in. There are no phase diagrams for most of the systems. And so this is why it's a sketch. And this sketch to show, it's a phase diagram, say from molybdate sulfide to molybdate telluride. This is temperature. And we care about the solid state alloy. So this, and, and we don't care about the melting uh, for this exercise. So basically, right in this region, we would like to have a homogeneous transition of keeping the same crystal structure and changing the band gap that as dramatically as from 1.5 to zero. And the question here is, on the phase diagram, are we actually allowed to mix them without breaking the, the phase? And on in a lot of systems, there is a miscibility gap where you cannot put too much tellurium into molybdate sulfide because of the different atomic size. Same thing on that side. If you take molybdate telluride and you start substituting for sulfur, sulfur is much smaller, and so lattice can only accommodate, potentially can only accommodate like 20% of, of that sulfur. After that, the, the phases fall into two. And this is... It's just the illustration, right? It, it, it's the uh, pitfall how phase diagrams can help to guide the process being aware of, of the miscibility gap. But we have a calculations too. But the point is, you don't want to walk in that region because you no, no longer have a homogeneous alloy. You have to be where there are no lines, there are no miscibilities. So you have to be at high temperature. Example of a calculation. It's slightly different system. This is tungsten sulfide, tungsten telluride. This is DFT uh, modeling here. But this is just to illustrate without going into details that at high temperature, this is Kelvin, we're good, we're fine. So when we like to mix sulfide and telluride in 2H structure, this is a 2H structure, then above certain temperature, there are no lines, there are no barriers. So you can mix them at will from zero to 100%. But the calculations show that needs to be proven experimentally that below this temperature there is ordering and it's very interesting uh, pattern of ordering on the metal sub uh, on a chalcogen sublattice where say sulfur makes patches hexagonal patches in a regular fashion or there is another ordering at that composition of 66 percent which is tripe phase so for for the practical side if we encounter this type of ordering when we're trying to alloy, that kills the device. We can't work with this bunch of different phases. We would like to be in a single phase region. And so from the practical point of view, when we think of band gap engineering, uh, the phase diagram should help, either modeling phase diagram or experimental, should help us to understand is this feasible or not feasible. Um, next illustration. Of, of the phase diagram used. I'm going back to the MOT2 phase, is the, again, on the alloy side. And the reason I brought this up is, uh, as it was uh, discussed throughout the day today, is this temperature phase change from 2H to 1T prime is too high. You cannot make the device, you cannot cycle it at that temperature. Uh, and we do cycle it, say, in our lab, but it's a thermal cycling. You put the ampule, keep it, answering uh, Evan's question, keep it a few hours, not minutes, at that temperature, converts to T prime. Bring it down, keep it for an hour, uh, temperature goes, uh, sorry, the phase changes. Not minutes, but hours. Now, but this is not practical for the device application. So th this is where the alloying comes to into the game, 
And this is where the phase diagram comes to the game. So the, the goal here, as again, Jim and, and, and Evan actually described, is now let's try the alloy with the tungsten and let's bring this temperature, transition temperature from 900 C to room temperature even below. And the phase diagram tells that. It says, yes, you can do that. And so this is the phase diagram. Remember, we're in a tricompositional field, so we have to put a triangle here, molybdenum, tungsten, tellurium. Then we need to identify where the phase is. So this is molybdenite on the side of molybdenum. This is tungsten dithelorite on the side of the uh, tungsten tellurium. And that's the line we're interested in. And so working with that phase diagram, and there are at least three diagrams already published in the literature, which needs to be reconciled. So this is what this is from, from our story. What, what you see here, focusing on the phase change, is that right in this region, and it's just a cross section of the diagram, right? You, you take this triangle or 3D diagram and you slice a vertical pi, so temperature showing out of the plane here, and so this is the slice. So on this slice of a phase diagram, this is the area that we're mostly interested in. At, at pure molybdenite, phase changes 900, 800, at about 10% or so, it goes down to room temperature. So this is where we would like to work with the material uh, using different mechanisms for switching, whether it's a gate effect or strain or pressure or, well, pressure is probably not practical, uh, strain, um, field-induced, gate-induced, or temperature. It could be joule heating, right? If, if you walking in the area of, say, I mean, this is all schematic here. Uh, sorry, no, this is 200. This is 200C. Uh, if you're walking in the area 200C phase change, it's very easy to induce uh, local heating in a joule heating and, and then cycle it back and forth. And then the diagram becomes much more complicated as you move farther, not only because of 1T prime, but also because of the TD phase. It's another uh, crystal structure in which tungsten telluride is stable on. And so ideally, this is the map that need, need to exist for all of the system and the alloys so that when we start making the material, we need to be aware, is this a single phase, like these blue squares or circles, or it's a two-phase material. So uh, moving on, and that's the last example of, of phase diagram application. Thank you uh, for, for the contacts engineering. And here, uh, let's look at that approach, which is being practiced in few labs right now, is to make an, a lateral junction between semiconductor and metallic phase. Right? And that's ideal for the lateral device, uh, where you put the metal contact on top of this metallic TMD rather than the semiconducting TMD. And so the approaches are, phase engineering, right? It could be phase change that I just described on the previous slide, or it could be a E-beam anneal or thermal. And so there are two examples here. One on the left, this is from uh, Bob Wallace's group. What they did, they exposed molybdenite to H, thin layer, to 450 C Celsius. What are they doing? They're trying to get the tellurium away, right? They're trying to sublime tellurium away from the material. And what happens here, they grow nanowires of conducting phase, and that's what you want to have. You have to have a metallic phase on top of your semiconductor. And this composition they assigned to is MO6TE6. So they were able, and this is a cross-section of the same, so this is 2H, it's looking at the edge of the sample. So this is a uh, almost literally you know, very nice TM image of 2H phase on the cross-section. This is 100 zero zero axis. And this is a MO66 phase, which is different crystal structure metallic. So another example of how to engineer a conducting line is uh, electron beam. You burn a couple of holes, and this is from the paper of Lee in 2014. And then you convert this junction, the bridge, into conducting phase. And again, what you notice is that here, we lost tellurium relative to the initial phase, and here we lost sulfur. So we started MOS2, we ended up MOS. And so point is here is that the sublimation of the chalcogen 
leads to the new phase converting from semiconducting MOT to, to something else. And the same question, right? I'm showing all over all over the same phase diagram where uh, if this is 2H phase on the phase diagram, right, then we're losing tellurium. Tellurium lost, meaning we're going that way. So phase diagram will tell us what is the phase that you're trying to form. And in this case, on, in a bulk material, it would have been 6, 8. It's also metallic. But in a thin film state, there are metal stable phases like that one. It doesn't exist on the phase diagram. But it's the right direction to move when you start losing tellurium, right? You get less tellurium in this phase or less sulfur in that phase. So for us, what we did, we proven that, yes, you can actually convert the phase from molybdite telluride to tellurium deficient phase, which is that one. It's 6.8. It's close to 6.6, but it's a different stoichiometry. And what you see here is a very simple experiment. We took molybdite telluride bulk or, or single crystal, not a monolayer, but few layers. And then we exposed this to high temperature. It was around 700 C. So we started moving right to away from tellurium into this two-phase region. So we already knew what, we, what we're getting. We were getting this phase, and this little, not little, but significant size crystals appearing on the surface is a conversion from MOT2 to 6-8 phase. And this is proven on the X-ray diffraction. It is also proven in the Raman system. And it's actually the first Raman signal that we were, uh, were able to produce uh, from this phase. And so illustration of that of contact engineering, <clears throat> even when we know which way we go, like losing tellurium or, or, or reverse, the phase diagrams helps to visualize and to predict what phase we should expect, expect to form. And the last, uh, last example here um, of the contact engineering, this is more of the awareness of where why do we need to think the phase diagram? So this is an example from 2014 paper, McDonald. Basically, they put the band alignment right for the molybdite sulfide. This is the band gap of molybdite sulfide. And this is work function for different metals. And from the simple band diagram, uh, band theory, you would expect, for example, chrome and titanium nitride to be very similar in behavior, right? Because they all, if you think of the barrier height, this you just subtract one from another or, you know, work function uh, and the band gap alignment. And then we should see the same current density uh, at the same voltage. But look how far they are apart. Chrome and titanium nitride, they're not even close. So it's all messed up. And the uh, band gap alignment is not applied here. And then the proof of that, that something's going on, is in this uh, XPS spectra, where the black is pure molybdate sulfide. Uh, signature, and then the red little bumps appearing is the indication of chemical reaction between chrome, in this case, and molybdate sulfide. And so that brings it back to the same story that it's no longer the case of metal on 2D material with or without, without Van der Waals gap. It's not important. It's important that we have alloying in the system. It's indication of that. And again, when we say alloying, what we do is just to put the phase diagram together. And, and this is a phase diagram, still schematic, but this is a ternary system, molybdenum, sulfur, chrome. So we map the, the components, molybdate sulfide, and then all the known phases of the system. So chrome, chrome sulfide is a very stable compound. So you can guess that the, when you put chrome on molybdate sulfide, chrome will pull out sulfur and form this very stable phase. And then when we plot the tie line between chrome and molybdate sulfide, then apparently there are other phases that exist in a bulk, at least. So there is this uh, two, chrome 1, MO2, S4 phase. There is another phase there. And what it tells us, the, this phase diagram, it says that, well, when you put the metal on top of the uh, semiconductor and when you do the processing, be aware that you may actually end up having a compounds formed at the interface, and the band theory would still apply, but now instead of chrome uh, walk function, you have to put the walk function for whatever phases ended up at the interface, if, if it's possible to deconvolve. 
But again, this is illustration of knowing the reactions between metal conduct and, and the semiconductor. You would like to be aware of the potential phases that are forming. So with that, let me finish. And the take home message I would like for myself and, and for us, for the audience, is really think of the phase diagrams as a guiding synthesis and processing of materials uh, on, on the map of composition, temperature, and, and pressure. On, on the pressure side, that would be a separate presentation where, you know, for example, sulfur or oxygen pressure, same phase diagram, but now they change as a function of pressure. It changes the melting point, it changes the uh, homogeneity range, and so the, the simple message here is to uh, employ, think about phase diagrams each time we work with the materials. So with that, let me finish, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, I think Evan was mentioned that the phase diagram is a extreme case, right? It's the uh, what, where you can get to in the pure thermodynamic terms without kinetics. That's number one. So understanding that the phase diagram that you find in the literature is the uh, end case of, of the full conversion of the going to the full equilibrium, right? That, that's the peace of mind to understand that maybe when, when you work with your system, you will not necessarily get all the way from A to B as the phase diagram tells you. That's, that's number one. Uh, the second point is being aware of the environment in the synthesis or processing. Small amount of oxygen can mess up your phase diagram thinking because you're no longer in a molecularium phase, right? You, you have to put the oxygen which dissolves from the surface of, say, quartz reactor or from other processing. So the short answer would be it's a textbook, right? It's a Bible. Open the Bible, right? And, and look at the phase diagram. And then think through this is the case when everything works, you know, it takes me 100 years to get to that state or maybe one hour to get to the state. Think of the other components that are loaded. And, and then just go from there. So it's not a necessarily a conversion to make the phase diagram to work. It's only guidelines, guidance, to help to think what is possible. So it doesn't have to be reconciled, really, with, with your full electrical experiment, for example. But it's a good guidance for the story. Can I ask a question? Yeah. One of the things about 2D material growth that uh, I, I I'm kind of just like your your understanding on is that um, you have to make sure that it will grow too deep, right? And a lot of times I've talked with growth people, they're saying, oh, well, under these conditions, it actually will grow three-dimensional. You know, it'll start going up like in a trajectory uh -huh. or something as opposed to out, uh, you know, laterally. Right. Is there, is there a way to understand you know, with some sort of systematic methodology how to get things to grow 2D versus 3D? Um. Well, for, for maybe a two-part answer, for the exfoliation purposes, you would like to grow 3D, right? For the uh, process of exfoliating the material, the goal is to grow single crystal. And this is typically a bulk layered material. So it's, it's always layered. That's the nature of the, right, say, molyditellurite in this case. Uh, when we're talking about CVD processes, an MOCVD, right, where you would like to go layer first, and, and to prevent the second layer going top. Uh, first of all, this is not a phase diagram uh, part here, but it's just a uh, kind of a doomed state of the material because you take the best part of the 2D, which is uh, Van der Waals forces, very weak uh, bonding between the layers. Uh, but the negative side of that Van der Waals uh, weak forces is that you cannot employ traditional semiconductor step movement growth uh, or right, when you flow from one side of the uh, facet into another building the atoms into it because of the nature of, of that weak bonding between the layers. So you cannot force 
this uh, layered growth um, in, in a fashion that you do with this. And this is the reason that there is no bulk, truly bulk single crystalline monolayers or even multilayers. The second problem there is that for the same reason that 2D materials or layered materials being Van der Waals forces, um, substrate typically guides the process, the growth. Right? You, 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 you know how to align and if it actually grow the material. Because of the weak nature of the bonding between molybdysulfide and sapphire, you can't even nucleate again at the edge of the wafer and move on. You nucleate multiple places and you hope for these grains, triangles to merge without grain boundaries. And so really it's a doomed part of the state of the art as to how do you get there? Is it just nature of the material? Right. Oh, yeah, uh, it's a good question, right? Can you repeat the question? Uh, yes, the, the question is whether a uh, phase diagram for the bulk material, which I was showing, applies to the uh, monolayer or few layer materials. Is that, uh, well, the simple answer, say, in quantum dots or nanoparticles, right? If the melting temperature of gold is, can't remember, 906, can't remember, 1000 Celsius, right? That's the gold bulk. Melton temperature of nanoparticle of gold can be as low as 300 lower or 400 C lower. And so that's part of the answer is when you scale down, then you have to uh, reassess the Gibbs energies or the energy of the phases, which do depend on the dimension, dimensionality. So therefore, again, the bulk diagram is the extreme case of, of a um, bulk vault, right? When you go to 2D, have to be aware of melting temperatures will be lower. Um, then the phase boundaries may shift as a result of that. But this is all doable. So all the calculations that have been done, DFT or um, even multi-scale modeling, can take into account the low dimensionality and recalculate the Gibbs energy uh, for, for the phase. Experimentally, I showed the case of Phase diagrams was showing us 6-8, MOLLE 6, Tellurium 8. The experiment showed 6-6. Six, six. So this is that metastable diagram for thin film, which reminds us what the bulk is, but it, it could be different. You can miss the phase, you can make a different phase, and I would call it that metastable state of, from the bulk uh, universe of the bulk material. Okay, right. Okay, so let's, uh, let's take uh, okay. a and I have, sorry.